You're listening to the Impact Showdown with Lee Sanders. Thursday evening to everybody. This is our Thursday night edition of Impact Showdown. I am, as always, of course, the Black Avenger, Lee Sanders. I thank you all for checking out tonight's episode on June 26, 2012. Just a few more days, and we will have June in the books. Folks, definitely appreciate you all that are checking out this live show right now on blogtalkradio.com and over at our sister website, over at infinity one productions dot com remember you can always hit us up on Twitter at infinity one prod and you can hit us up on our Facebook page. We also have a fan page on there as well. It's really cool. Go check it out. It's over on Facebook at infinity one productions. We got a pretty good show that's gonna be lined up for you all tonight as in just a little bit. We'll be talking about. What all transpired on the latest installment of Impact Wrestling, for those of you that might have missed it. And we'll also be sharing thoughts about the new Charlie Sheen sitcom, Anger Management, which premiered on FX earlier tonight. I will be joined by the lovely co-producer Tammy, who's going to be making another rare appearance, as she definitely wanted to get in on a discussion and chime in her thoughts on Charlie Sheen's new sitcom. Find out from us in just a little bit whether or not Charlie Sheen's new show is going to be a success or if it's going to be doomed for failure. So we'll be having that come up in just a little bit, folks. If you want to join in on a number of the topics that we're going to be discussing on tonight's show, you are more than welcome to do so, my friends. All you got to do is just kick back, smile, and dow, and you'll be live on the air Call us toll-free at 1-888-342-9848. Once again, that telephone number is toll-free, 1-888-342-9848. Just kick back, smile, and dial. You'll be live on the air. Now, we just have to mention before we go into tonight's show that for those of you that did not have the opportunity to check out our Tuesday night edition of the RCWR show, highly recommend that you go check it out because we had a very special guest come on there, guitarist, metal guitarist at that, by the name of Xander Demas, who came on to the show. And, man, did we have a really great time as we talked about all things rock and metal. It was a really great interview. We just had a blast doing it. It was very fun. It was very engaging. On behalf of myself, co-producer Tammy, Zed, we can't thank Xander enough for taking time out of his schedule to be on the show and do the interview. And folks, if you haven't checked out the interview yet, go check it out right now. It's available on iTunes, Zoom Marketplaces, and it's in our archive section on Blog Talk Radio. For all three that I just mentioned, just use the keywords, the RCWR show, and you'll be able to run into it that way. While you're at it, do yourself a favor, especially if you're a rock and metal fan. Go check out Xander Demons' new CD titled Guitar Acadia. It is a phenomenal album, some really great stuff. You're going to love it, trust me. If we're plugging it here on Impact Showdown and the RCWR show, then you know it's definitely some good stuff. So go check it out. New album, Guitar Acadia. It's available in iTunes, Zoom Marketplaces. It's also available on the Amazon.com website. Now, we're going to switch things up just a little bit. We were going to talk about the Charlie Sheen's new sitcom, Anger Management, later on during the show. But the lovely Tammy, she has a few prior commitments that she has to attend to. One of them involves going out of town 
business-related deal for us. So we're actually going to go on ahead and we're going to bring her into the conversation mix right now and have her share her thoughts. Uh, as long as, you know, I'll definitely be chiming in as well because we actually did both watch it at the same time. I know multitasking at its best. So without any further ado, let's go on ahead and let's go right into it because we know Tammy's got a flight that she's got to catch in a, fl- in a few hours here. Lovely Tammy, how you been, hon? Oh, goodly, good, good. All right. I wish you were here right now helping me out with the show, but I, I know that you got to do what you got to do over there. It's all in the good name of the RCWR show, so definitely appreciate you making those moves that you're doing over there. So let's get right into it because I know you're a little bit pressed for time. So how did you like Charlie Sheen's new sitcom, Anger Management, tonight? I actually found it very funny. Uh, quite a bit of a surprise, um, you know, with the success of the last show, but then, you know, his uh, lovely exit from it. Um, but it actually reminded me just a bit of the old show and, and what I liked about it. Uh, it definitely had some funny one-liners. I, I won't lie, I found myself, you know, cracking up out loud. Yeah, I did too. I really was not sure what to expect of this new series because I've been paying attention to everything Charlie Sheen and Charlie Sheen's new TV series ever since it was first announced months back. And that's how early I've stayed on top of the story. As soon as he was a couple of weeks done with being released from his contract of doing two and a half men and you had the little rumblings that was going on as he was on his little rant bashing everybody it seemed like within just weeks fx they came in contact with him and he had the desire to want to do a new tv series fx mind you they don't even see a script they don't even get a pitch they don't get nothing. All they know is, oh, Charlie Sheen wants to do a show? Okay, let's do it. Let's get him. And so we're like, okay, so Charlie Sheen has a new show on FX, but what the hell is it about? What's going on? We don't even have a name for the series, folks. This is how the negotiations just went down with FX. But then as the days turned in, the weeks, we would find out, oh, well, the name of the new series is going to be Anger Management. Then it's kind of like, okay, well... What's anger management about? Obviously, the title suggests something. Is this going to kind of play off of what was going on with Charlie Sheen in real life or what? What What is this series actually going to be about? But then as the weeks progressed even more, we would learn that it's kind of playing off of the movie a few years back starring Jack Nicholson and Adam uh, Sandberg. And... I must admit, it. as I was watching this episode, it had shades of two and a half men. It had me, you know, I can't agree with you enough. It, it definitely reminded me of two and a half men, but it was more catered towards the adults because I could definitely understand in retrospect what Charlie Sheen was talking about with regards to how silly, how slapstick, how juvenile two and a half men had started to become within the last few years as he felt that they were just recycling the same gags over and over and over again. I don't know if you were picking that up as well, but during this show it just really came off as if it was two and a half men, 2.0 version, catered towards adults. Right. I I kind of agree with that. Uh, I did feel like it was a little bit of the same rehashed Um version on that but uh it actually folks it was this um basically he was a former baseball player who actually has the anger management issues um and is a therapist uh who is actually dealing with patients on that level yeah i know right how cool is that i mean and he still <laughs> has his own problems because he has a dysfunctional 
uh, daughter, apparently, who when she gets really stressed out, upset about something, she goes a little OCD and she keeps messing with the locks like multiple times. And, Tammy, you want to talk about a great cast that they had on there for, well, they premiered with an hour special, but you can really break it down in the two episodes. But what a great cast that they had to start off the series. I mean, we had Homegirl from Grace Under Fire. Uh, We had Beverly Hills, 90210, Brian Austin Green, um, who, in my honest opinion, he's been looking better and better with age. I mean, he's really looking real GQ now that Father Time's kind of caught up to him a little bit. Uh, We had uh, Michael Boatman, who's a well-established African-American actor. He's done work on series such as Arliss on HBO. He uh, had an extended run on Spin City. Who can forget that? I mean, he was there while Michael J. Fox was holding the reins down on that show. And then Charlie Sheen coming in. And it just seemed like the chemistry that Michael Boltman had with Charlie Sheen on Spin City, it just seemed like after all these years later, those two guys were just able to pick up right where they left off because Michael Boltman, folks, on the new series Anger Management, he uh, apparently he is Charlie's, and that's his character's name, uh, next-door neighbor who's just infatuated with some of the hot women that Charlie Sheen has coming into his home because he does the private um, lessons there, uh, counseling lessons there at his at his home. And uh, Michael Bowman's character it seems like he's always trying to figure out a way to come in there and possibly holler at some of the women that are in there. He kind of reminds you of a modified, sophisticated version of Larry on Three's Company. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, that is that is somewhat true. The You know, the guy that keeps kind of coming over just for any excuse to uh, be involved, get involved uh, with whatever Charlie's doing at the time. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, let's break uh, right down into it because now you all folks that weren't able to see the series, you now have the backstory for the series. Let's just go right down to the heart of the matter, and let's be honest with this TV series. Tammy, I definitely want to give you the floor for however long you want to run with it. What was your honest thoughts about the TV series with regards to, do you feel that what you saw tonight was enough to make you say, okay, I'll definitely come back. I'm hooked on this show. They've got me for a little bit. Do you think that the series is a success, or do you do you feel that more work needs to kind of be made for this series? Because remember, we've been saying it within the past week and a half, folks, a lot is riding on Charlie Sheen's new sitcom, okay? A lot is riding because FX, they're going to be paying attention to the first 10 episodes. So they're going to be watching this for the first 10 weeks. If they like what they see ratings-wise, they are prepared to order 90 episodes. Now, for you trivia TV buffs, usually when it comes to 100 episodes of a sitcom, that means that they're around for five years at least. So FX is willing to make that commitment. Tammy, do you feel that you saw enough? I know it's early, but do you feel that you saw enough to determine whether or not this series will be a success and FX should go ahead and commit to it for the next five years? Well, that's really quite a uh, big question. Um, I I definitely feel that the show is something that has my attention for now. Um, Now, as far as something to, I'll definitely be watching to see what's kind of developing. Um, But as far as to order 90 episodes from what I've seen, uh, a little bit too early to tell. On, uh, for me on that uh, But definitely some very good points Definitely something that will make you laugh out loud uh, Definitely classic Charlie Sheen Just in a bit of a different look Because it's somewhat the skinnier uh, 
he he does not look as healthy as he did when he was on uh, Two and a Half Men. But but definitely it'll ha- it definitely has my attention for now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I must admit it has my attention as well. I know FX they are in the rebuilding process, if you will, because let's be honest, especially for those of you that are familiar with the network FX, they've been looking for that next lead guy they could kind of build FX around when it comes to the TV series, because think of how FX used to be, what, Tammy, about maybe five years ago? I mean, FX, they, they've been hurting because look at the recent TV series that have ended. I mean, great fucking series with Michael Chickalis, The Shield, who played mm-hmm. the corrupt cop Vic Mackey, and that was probably one of the greatest cop television series of all time, right up, uh, right up above Homicide, Life on the Street. I feel. And yeah, it, it actually won quite a few awards. It, exactly, it, you know. And don't even get me started on the shield. Don't don't even get me started because I will single handedly point out the one season where Forrest, Forrest Whitaker had joined the cast and he was just high off of his performance as Edie I mean uh in um oh God, I can't think of the movie. Last the last King of, Scotland. King of Scotland, thank you. Yeah, the last King of Scotland. I mean Forrest Whitaker, he did some freaking phenomenal work on that series when he was on there for about a season and a half. But FX, they've been hurting ever since The Shield ended. They've been hurting since Dennis Leary's uh, series, Rescue Me, ended. They've kind of been hurting since Nip Tuck finally ended. So they've been really in that process of trying to rebuild the brand. And we know that it's always sunny in Philadelphia. It's starting to get a little bit old now. Uh, You know, not too many hardcore people are going to want to tune into that show every single week just to try to watch Danny DeVito. No disrespect to him. He's he's a great writer. He's got a great mind, but Father Time's caught up to him just a little bit. So, yeah, FX, they've kind of been hurting, and I just question their decision to want to commit to Charlie Sheen for five years because it's like, wait a minute, man. Let him prove himself. I would honestly, if I was FX, and this would be my message to them, as much as you want to try to secure a Hollywood celebrity for however amount of years, you should really try this on a trial basis. I would do it like Conan O'Brien's TV show on um, on TBS. You know, they renew his contract every year. I think it needs to be one of those type of deals, you know, renew it every season, reevaluate that way. You know, because, I mean, honestly, Tammy, you don't know. You might have another two-and-a-half-men explosion on your hands, and then you're committed for five years. You know, then you have to pay a freaking penalty for wanting out of the contract early. That's true. That is so true. Uh, with that, you know, after ten episodes, I mean, the, the train is really just getting started mm-hmm. at, at ten episodes, and to order another ninety, you know, just depending on what the numbers are at that point, uh, maybe just a bit premature. But hopefully, you know, I think what FX was thinking is maybe they'll strike gold twice, you know, or as as far as with Charlie Sheen with Two and a Half Men and the success of that because he was still very successful with Two and a Half Men even going through all of his issues. Yeah, 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 no doubt about it. And, I mean, let's not uh, let's not forget how how uh, the Two and a Half uh, Men, um, um, let's not forget how they are now. I mean, ever since Charlie left, who could uh, not forget the uh, – first amount of ratings that had kicked in for the show when Ashton Kutcher took over. I mean, you and me, we were watching it along with Zed. We all were watching it and we're talking about it. We thought it was phenomenal. It was one of the highest rated episodes of like, I think, all freaking time for the series. But then slowly the ratings started dropping and everybody started realizing, okay, whatever, where's Charlie? I mean, you even have the hardcore Charlie Sheen fans that are sitting up now and saying, well, look, if I can't have new episodes of Two and a Half Men with Charlie Sheen, I'm going to go check out the old episodes. 
So, yeah, a lot is riding on. And for those of you that are kind of like, why are you guys talking about Charlie Sheen for so long? Here's the beautiful part, folks. It all connects to wrestling because in case you missed it, okay, Charlie Sheen is going to be making a appearance on social media, if you will, on Twitter in just a few weeks as he will be WWE's social media ambassador for the 1,000th episode of Raw. So he will be on Twitter throughout the night tweeting to his legions of fans, and he'll also be tweeting with the WWE Universe about what all is transpiring on that night's 1,000th episode of Raw. That is the beautiful part of how it all connects. We only thought it would be fair to talk about it. Hey, we got to do a little bit more than just talk about wrestling. So for those of you that appreciated that little, you know, uh, talk about Charlie Sheen's new sitcom, especially for those of you that might have been a little bit on the fence about checking it out, now it's up to you. You can either DVR it, check it out on your own free will, come to your own conclusions, but we just thought we would share that little piece of information with you. Lovely Tammy, I thank you so much for chiming in your thoughts. I know you got to try to get a little bit of rest. And uh, you got an early flight tomorrow. I guess I'll be seeing you, what, uh, next Tuesday? Yeah, that sounds like a plan. Hopefully we'll see you next Tuesday. Well, you know, definitely let me know when you touch ground out there and uh, have safe travels, okay? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lee. All right. Thank you for uh, doing this tonight. I appreciate it. The lovely Tammy folks. So there we have it with regards to Charlie Sheen. So, Let's go on ahead now and let's switch gears a little bit because we know we got that hardcore audience. Give me my damn wrestling, God damn it! Okay, well, we got you covered. We're going to go on ahead and we're going to talk about wrestling right now. So we just saw TNA Impact Wrestling go off the air. And did I call it? I think somebody that might have been working in the TNA organization, they must have been listening to my show last Thursday night because they – obviously tried their best to clean up the storyline that was going on with AJ Styles, Dixie Carter, and that poor hell of an actress, Claire. Uh, We'll definitely get into that more in just a little bit, but I just thought that was very interesting that they tried to clean that up. I wish I had a soundbite right now of what I had said last week, but I'll touch up more on that in just a little bit folks let's go ahead and kick you guys off with how the episode had kicked off for those of you that might have missed it earlier tonight and you know how we do it over here we're definitely going to give you honest analysis review of tonight's episode and we would see in a backstage segment AJ Styles talking with TNA president Dixie Carter about how He feels so vindicated now that Claire had stepped forward and she basically made everything right, that now the truth is out in the open with regards to what all had really been going on between AJ Styles and Dixie Carter. And Dixie is feeling relieved just as well as AJ is telling Dixie, hey, I can't wait to have my tag match against Daniels and Kazarian tonight as it's just going to be icing on the cake, and he's really excited. He just really feels like a burden has just been taken off of his shoulders. And from there, we would see our first match of the evening, which would see Mr. Anderson taking on RVD as the Bound for Glory series continues. And one interesting note that was pointed out by commentators Taz and Mike Tanay, they announced that Hulk Hogan has made a decision with regards to future Bound for Glory matches, which is from here on now, every single Bound for Glory match will have a 15-time limit, a 15-minute time limit. So get a little bit more fun for your viewing pleasure. Now, we would see RVD pick up the win via pin as he would do a really awesome modified version of a crucifix pin on Mr. Anderson, and he was able to pick up seven points. And last we had saw the leaderboards, as to my knowledge, they had only showed it once 
during uh, the entire episode. It looks as if RVD is now tied with Mr. Anderson, so it looks like he could very possibly bump him off as I believe in the leaderboards, they're tied at seven. As we go more into tonight's episode of Impact Wrestling, I'll definitely get you all caught up on what all has been happening with the latest for the Bound for Glory leaderboards. But I just thought that that was just a really phenomenal match. And it, But at the same time, I kind of said to myself, hmm, of the guys to push, because I know some people were sitting up a while back and they said, why RVD? He's so old. Why the hell are we pushing him? Doesn't make any sense. And I could definitely appreciate that argument from a lot of people. At the same time, you look at Mr. Anderson, I think it's cute how he comes out and he does the little microphone thing and he repeats his name twice and he says asshole, but the way he walks, the way he tries to move into the ring, I'm always reminded of Stone Cold Steve Austin, and I don't like thinking about Stone Cold Steve Austin when I look at Mr. Anderson, because for me, that's not a compliment. I'm not complimenting Mr. Anderson. It just seems like he's trying very hard to be a Stone Cold Steve Austin, and he's not, because the minute that he gets in the ring, I don't know what the heck I'm looking at, because it's a completely, totally different character, I feel. And so, with that in mind, I got to kind of give the edge to RVD a little more because I'm happy to see RVD being put back into that uh, that spotlight, if you will. Now, will he win the Bound for Glory series? No, I, I seriously doubt that he's he's going to win. I just don't see that happening. I would be shocked if he were to win the Bound for Glory series, but I just don't see it happening but I'm glad that from the looks of things it comes off as if they're possibly trying to elevate him more so um, that's going to do it for that match and then let's move right along now with the rest of the card now from there immediately after that match was over we would see the X Division champion Austin Aries come down and he would address the Impact crowd and he shed his thoughts on how last year he made a hell of an impression in the TNA organization and basically look at him now as he's getting ready to take on the TNA World Heavyweight Champion Robert Roode. And he points out how he came up with the option C, which was to basically give future X Division title holders an opportunity to relinquish their title to take on the TNA World Heavyweight Champion at the Destination X pay-per-view. What a great way to kind of make that belt. I won't even say kind of because it actually makes that X Division title even that more significant because, you know, it's, it's the second best belt. It's the next best thing in the company, as he would point out how a lot of men have held that title over the years and that he couldn't just relinquish the title just to take on Robert Rui without knowing that there was going to be some type of a payoff that would continue on after he has his chance at Robert Rude. But then another interesting question would come into mind, which would be, okay, well, What's going to be the future for the X Division? And the future for the X Division would be as follows, as Austin Aries would reveal that, hey, there's going to be a tournament that's going to be going on to determine a new X Division champion. And from what I've seen, you know, there are old X Division competitors, wrestlers that are in the back, hungry for the opportunity. There are new X Division wrestlers that want the opportunity to be able to become X Division champions so they could have the same opportunity as I have, as they now look at me as the man. And we would get an appearance by the TNA champion, 
Robert Roode who would come down to the ring and he would say to Austin Aries, hey, your belt, it doesn't mean anything. You know, this belt that I'm holding is the real heavyweight championship and that the belt has more significant value because of what all he has single-handedly done. This is what he's claiming now as he wants to talk about opportunities. And he says, the only reason why you got the opportunity that you have over guys that are busting their asses doing what they need to be doing to get a shot at my title is because of Hulk Hogan. He's like, you and your stupid option C, it really is nothing but a failure because... You're setting yourself up for failure. And he would also point out that the X division is going to be set up for failure because the it factor of professional wrestling will make sure that Austin Aries fails. And from there he would tell him, you're not even in my league. Do me a favor, kid. Get the hell out of my ring. And Austin Aries did not even back down. Austin Aries, he would sit up and he would say, well, look, you want me to get the hell out of your ring, huh? Okay, well, how about if I say to you that this is my ring? What if I say to you I feel this is my ring and I don't want to get the hell out of this ring? What are you going to do? And the two, they start giving each other a wicked stare down and they start unbuttoning their clothes Austin takes off his shirt. Rude, he's unbuttoning his shirt. And it looks like these two guys are about to start throwing rights and lefts. But Robert Rude, he just smiles at him and takes his title, rolls out, and just looks on at him. And, you know, one of the things I was noticing, and it just dawned on me. I don't know if you all might have noticed it, but it just dawned on me. Besides Robert Roode looking pretty freaking awesome with his new super cut haircut, he looks like a young, slimmer, cooler version of Matt Morgan. I don't know if you guys kind of peeped that out. Because I remember there was a time where Matt Morgan, he actually used to have uh, the same type of color hair and facial hair as Robert Roode is pushing right now. I know he's been doing the blondish look for a little while now, but he actually used to have dark hair and a dark beard. I just thought it was kind of interesting how Robert Roode just, I don't know, you got to go back and look at it, but to me, he looked like Matt Morgan tonight. I don't know what the hell that was about. But from there, folks, we would see a Claire recap. And I must admit, when I heard that there was going to be a Claire recap, I was like, okay, please don't show her pitiful performance in the middle of the ring from last week because that just did not sell. Luckily, they did not do that. They realized, TNA creative-wise, they realized that putting her in the spotlight and just having her just talk really was not a good idea because she came off really weak. So this week, Creative was very smart as they had her play along with Dixie Carter in a backstage segment as the cameramen are asking her questions and asking her how was it that she had came across AJ Styles and and Dixie Carter and she would mention how uh, she had bumped into AJ while she was basically on her path to recovery and that actually she had been good friends with Dixie Carter for many years that they actually had met at a party that Dixie Carter was throwing. And from there, the next question that would be put out there to her was if she knew Daniels and Kazarian beforehand, perhaps with them passing, and she said, no, she didn't. And from there, we would see another backstage segment now where we see Kazarian and Daniels are fighting, and Kazarian points out that, hey, he has been friends with AJ Styles for 12 years and feels that Daniels, through his lies, being deceitful, that he basically got played and got made to feel like an idiot and that he's done participating in Daniels' game of charades. Now, from there, folks, we would see our second match of the night, 
which would be a X Division tournament match as, man, check this out, folks. Get ready. We had the return of the one and only, my man, Sun J. Dutt. That's right. Now, for those of you that are Sun J. Dutt fans, you all know that Dutt hasn't been in TNA for at least almost three and a half years. As the last time he had any type of association with them was back in 2009, and he had basically left TNA after his contract expired due to he and TNA management not being able to come to terms on a new deal. And who could forget one of the last storylines that Sanjay Dutt was involved in as he had tried to come up with all these different schemes to ruin Jay Letho and SoCal Val's wedding when he had begged Val to marry him instead. And that would end up in Dutt attacking Letho, and then he began a real villainous heel turn which led to the two of them facing off at Victory Road. Then they followed it up at Hard Justice, splitting the victories. Then at the No Way, no, uh, the No Surrender pay per view, it was uh, Val had turned on Jay Lethal and had assisted Dutt in winning a Ladder of Love ladder match. Just a little history for you guys that need a little help jogging your memory on Sanjay Dutt. He looked pretty freaking phenomenal in his return match as he had took on probably a newcomer to a lot of people, definitely a newcomer to me, a guy by the name of Rubix. And brother, I've been writing for about 20 plus years now. I have had the luxury of coming up with comic book characters. I've actually pitched comic book characters to a couple of comic book companies. I've pitched some stuff to Marvel. I've pitched some stuff to DC. Let me tell you something, brother. If you're going to call yourself Rubik's, do me a favor, man. Actually look like a Rubik's because what I saw tonight was Jigsaw Puzzle. So I'm trying to connect the dots. I'm trying to understand why are you calling yourself Rubik's. I'm looking at your tattoos. I don't even see Rubik's anywhere on your body. Maybe I wasn't looking hard enough. I don't know. I, I'll tell you what. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I usually watch Impact Wrestling twice. So I have it on my DVR. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I will watch your match again and try to give you the benefit of the doubt. But I did not see anything Rubik's related. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying to myself, okay, shouldn't this guy have been called Puzzle Man, Puzzle, the Puzzler, uh, Mr. Pieces? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm just saying, you know, Jigsaw. Though Jigsaw, he probably couldn't get away with Jigsaw because Marvel owns the name and likeliness to that. So he would probably come across a little bit of a problem with that name. But that just really seemed to be more up his alley, I feel. So whatever. I mean, he looked pretty impressive. Don't get me wrong. I just have a problem with his wrestling in-ring name. I just feel that needs to be revamped a little bit. But nonetheless, Sanjay Dutt, I mean, he was looking really impressive in this contest. Both men were as Sanjay Dutt, he would pick up the win. And man, Sanjay Dutt, he still has it, folks. I mean, that man is still able to go up to that top turnbuckle and pull a Street Fighter too. You know that move for those of you guys that love playing the Street Fighter games. You know that move I'm talking about where you get M. Bison in the corner and you hold the little control down for a bit, and he just jumps in the air, and he just stomps at you with, with his two feet. I just love that freaking move. I think whenever Sanjay Dutt does that, I just am amazed at the fact that he can do that. And as one of our followers had pointed out, uh, Matthew Washington at Nerd Supreme, he said, Sanjay Dutt just M. Bison stomped that man's chest. I that mean that is so dead on point because that's exactly what I was thinking before I even saw that tweet. I was like, wow, I said, my man went Street Fighter on him. It was really awesome right there. Now from there, folks, we would see the TNA Gut Check judges as it's kind of drawing close as they are getting ready to gather in the conference room and they're going to discuss what they liked, what they disliked, overall thoughts on TNA Gut Check tryout contestant 
Taylor Hendricks, and it got pretty interesting in there as Bruce Pritchard, one of the judges, he would sit up and point out how, just as we pointed out on last week's Thursday night edition of Impact Showdown, how Taylor was really coming off like, this is my ring, you really need to prove yourself. I mean, she was really dominating in that match, and Bruce Pritchard would actually pick up on that, mentioning how Taylor was making... Hendrix earned the right to be in that ring trying to intimidate her. And, you know, it was it was really intense right there. Taz would point out how, hey, she had the cardio. She, you know, she looks good. But, you know, he kind of questions whether or not she has a sense of entitlement as he's a bit irritated with people that have been coming into Impact and kind of feeling as though they're owed something when really they're not. And Bruce Pritchard would kind of pick up on that and say, well, you know, do you want somebody that, you know, is is going to become a star? Do you want somebody that, uh, you know, are you looking for potential or are you looking for game ready? You know, what is it exactly that you're looking for? And Al Snow would also chime in his thoughts as well. And the basis of Al Snow's argument was really, hey, you know, I definitely feel that she has the potential, but I just have this hesitation of we build her up to where she needs to be, and she basically starts becoming a bit difficult to work with at the end. And we know exactly where he's, you know, where he's coming from with that because. We've heard of the stories, and I think a good example of that is, and you don't even have to watch WWE to know about this, but there's been plenty of times now where whoever has graced the front cover of the Playboy magazine in the past, WWE Diva that has posed for the Playboy magazine, they've gotten a little bit of a snotty attitude. They've kind of come off as if the whole world should be coming to them that they're queen shit and that everything everybody needs to bow down before them. And WWE, time and time again, when they've dealt with that type of difficulty where somebody feels that the business should be coming to them, they should be getting everything, when really they haven't done a damn thing, they give them their papers and they show them the door. So I can kind of understand Al Snow's argument and Bruce Pritchard, he would point out something very valid. He would say, well, look, you know, would you guys buy a pay-per-view to see her? And they all were pretty much in agreement with regards to the question that was asked by Bruce Pritchard just then, which was she's not quite ready, maybe in a few months, but for right now, no. So they seem to be a little bit on the fence right now as it's going to be – Coming up later tonight, their decision on whether or not Hendricks will be getting a TNA contract. Now, from there, folks, we would see our uh, next match, which would be Bully Ray taking on Samoa Joe as the Bound for Glory series continues. And this match, very intense, very physical, two big bulls just getting it on. I was really having a fun time just kicking back with a cold one and just watching these two guys get it on. The only thing I didn't like about this was Joseph Parks coming into this match. And critical point was Samoa Joe, Bully Ray. They're fighting outside of the ring. They're getting it on. Bully Ray, he takes out Samoa Joe with a nice, big, strong kick. And he sees that Samoa Joe is just laid out on the ground for a little bit and he kind of says to himself, hmm, well, now's a good time for me to kind of get back in the ring. Maybe I can win this match via countout, which really that kind of isn't the way you want to do it because that really doesn't get you that many points last I had checked, I don't think. So I could be wrong, but we'll check again in a little bit. But he gets in the ring, and he's just watching the ref count it down, and then Joseph Parks would get in the ring, and actually, no, Joseph Parks didn't even get in the ring. He came from the ramp area. He climbed on top of the apron, folks, and he was trying to get the attention of Bully Ray as Bully Ray would eventually turn around. 
And remember, just last week, Bully Ray had told Joseph Parks in a backstage segment that if he sees him or if he sees his brother Abyss, it's going to be the very last time that one of them is going to be seeing each other. And Joseph Parks, he did not heed this warning as he is getting in the face of Bully Ray, and it was basically a distraction, long enough a distraction for the Samoa machine, Samoa Joe, to come in from behind on Bully Ray, apply that rear naked choke to make him tap out for the victory. So Samoa Joe, he picked up an additional 10 points for making one submit. So if you pick up a win via submission, you get 10 points. If you just get it by pinfall, regular pinfall, you get 7 points. So Samoa Joe was looking very dominant right there, but post-match, is where things got really interesting as Joseph Parks would ask for a microphone and he would point out to Bully Ray, hey, you know, I've been bullied all my life growing up and, you know, I'm just at a point right now where, you know, I'm tired of being bullied. I'm I'm tired of you. I'm tired of everything that uh, that you're doing. And you know what? This is no longer about abyss. It's about me and it's about you bully ray as the fans they just start chanting you know to bully ray you tapped out you tapped out and joseph park says you know i'm sick of your crap the fans are sick of your crap and you know what it's time that we settle this once and for all as i have an idea you give me two weeks from tonight to get ready And I'll fight you again. And this time, I'm bringing the fight to you. And as soon as I heard Joseph Park say this, I just start thinking about Al Pacino. And I just, it's it's a silly, it's a silly line. But as soon as Joseph Park said this, I, you know, I got to do my Al Pacino because I've been told I, I do a great Al Pacino impression. My, what big balls you have. And I'm like, wow, Joseph, he was eating something or I don't know what happened to him the night before, but he really grew a nice set because now he's really stepping it up to Bully Ray. So they're they're going to be getting it on in two weeks unless Bully Ray says something different. Now, from there, Taz and Mike Tanay, they would mention the audio that was sabotaged by Daniels and Kazarian of AJ Styles, Dixie Carter's original conversation that they had on the phone. Remember, it kind of sounded like it might have been a a booty call, if you will. Well, you know, that obviously was not the case, and TNA, uh, they would, you know, take it upon themselves to release the phone tapes, and they made the audio archives available, and they also made uh, it be available in print. Now, here's what we have for you guys, because we'll, we'll actually hook you up with it right now. We have the full transcript right here, and this is basically how it went down. It's pretty short, so bear with me for just a moment. For those of you that did not check it out, here's the original phone call that is not sabotaged. Dixie, hello. AJ, hey, it's me. Dixie, hey, how are you? AJ, I'm good. Dixie, good. I'm so glad you called. I've been waiting to hear from you. Are you coming this weekend? AJ, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Dixie, I'm so glad. I am so glad. Serge is going to be so excited that you are going to be able to make it. And But do me a favor. Do not let them know you're coming into town, okay? I've kept this birthday party a secret long enough. Uh, He'll know once he pulls up, but up until that point, I really don't want him to have a clue. AJ, there's no way he's going to find out. This is going to be awesome. This is going to be a great party. I'm excited. Dixie, well, listen, you and Wendy, y'all bring the kids if you can. There'll be lots of families there, kids, jump houses, the whole thing. But I I can tell you, what it means to me that you're going to be here. AJ, well, let me ask you this, something. Uh, Since we're driving in, 
How long do you think it will be before Surge gets there? Dixie. Well, I think... AJ. How much time do we have? Dixie. You know, let me just... Do you mind if I text you? Like, when you are on the road and let you know and just kind of figure that out if you need a... If you need to hang back a while or whatever. AJ. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dixie. But, uh... I think I'll have a better idea once we get there. AJ, yeah. Just let me know. Give me a call. Dixie, okay. Talk to you soon. Can't wait. AJ, all right. Bye-bye. That's it. So, that's the original phone call right there. And my, how you can just eliminate certain words and just really make it come off like a hardcore booty call, folks. That's just really amazing right there. Now, from there, we would see a backstage segment where we see more interviewing happening with Dixie Carter and Claire. And one of the questions that's being thrown out there is, well, what's your comments with regards to the picture that's been surfacing of you hugging AJ Styles. Can you talk about that a little bit more? And Dixie Carter points out how she remembers that moment perfectly as that was the moment that she had found out just how bad things had got with Claire. And Claire would chime in her thoughts, speaking on how outraged she felt and how extreme Daniel Zikazarian took it to really take something that meant absolutely nothing and just twisted the way that they twisted. And another question that was thrown out there was, well, what about the hotel? You and AJ Styles rendezvous in at a hotel. It looked pretty intimate there. How do you respond to that? Dixie would point out how she was actually going to see Claire and that AJ was bringing Dixie to the hotel room to see Claire. So notice a little trend here, folks, as we have just a little bit of a, hey, here's this question. It's like they have an answer for everything. Sounds really perfect, doesn't it? Now, the phone conversation, we just mentioned it. Um, You know, that was brought up, but we saved you the trouble, so we don't even have to go through that again. Now, from there, we would see Kazarian in Hawk Hogan's office. And he basically is pleading with Hogan, hey, man, I didn't know what was going on. I was brainwashed for six months, and Hogan, he really wasn't buying it. He pointed out to him, hey, you had to have known something, man. You were with him for six months. Surely you knew some of the stuff that was going on. Surely you knew well enough to know that what you were doing was wrong, that you had no business doing it. At least own up to that. As that's really how Hogan was coming out there at Kazarian. He even even point out to him that he had a lot of respect for him, that he wasn't the same Kazarian that he knew when he first came to TNA. But Kazarian begs to differ. He says, no, he's still the same Kazarian, and he wants to prove it to Hogan as he feels he shouldn't have to be involved in this tag match coming up tonight. And Hulk Hogan would say, hey, you know, you got to be held accountable. You know, you have to do this match tonight. And, hey, if you're put into a position where Daniels decides he wants to leave you hanging and you're just going to be taking on Kurt Angle and Kazarian, uh, correction, Kurt Angle and AJ Styles alone, then so be it. But you're involved in this match tonight. Tonight is the night that we are really going to find out just what kind of man you're made of. And from there, Kazarian would leave Hulk Hogan's office disgruntled and say, yeah, yeah, well, thanks for the pep talk, you know, whatever. So he was definitely disgruntled right there. From there, we would see a backstage segment now where we see the lovely, cute little Smith and Madison Rain coming up on Garrett Bischoff. We hadn't seen Garrett Bischoff in, I think, maybe two weeks. I could be wrong. But it definitely feels like it's been at least two weeks now or more. And Gary Bischoff, he's minding his own business, and he's actually texting on his cell phone. Madison Rain comes up, and 
she says, so, you know, I was just wondering, you know, I I have this crush on a certain guy, and she's hesitating a little bit as as Garrett looks on, and he kind of thinks, hmm, maybe she's talking about me. And she asks him, you know, what's what's he like? And Garrett Bischoff says, huh? What's who like? And she doesn't mention the name out loud as she whispers it into his ear. And Garrett Bischoff, he just chuckles and he says, good luck with that as he walks off. So we now have Garrett Bischoff eliminated. So who is possibly left? Well, hopefully we'll know a little bit more, but it looks like the mystery is finally starting to come together there, folks. Now, let's move right on along now as we have our next uh, backstage segment, which saw Brooke Hogan, the new executive of the TNA Knockouts, talking with the new TNA Knockouts champion, Ms. Tess Mocker, and points out how Tess Mocker is going to be the new direct auto insurance spokesman as there's uh, posters that have already been made for her. And I'm sitting up and I'm watching this and I'm saying to myself, and I know, you know, we're supposed to get into wrestling news just a little bit later, but it's nice to switch it up a little bit, folks. I just couldn't help but say to myself, damn, they're really trying to move past Matt Morgan, aren't they? Because latest word that's been going around the wrestling beat is that Matt Morgan recently had made a appearance at the WWE headquarters down in Stanford, Connecticut. And, hey, we aren't really sure if Matt Morgan was offered a contract. If he was, things are probably being kept on a very tight leash right now. I honestly wouldn't expect for there to be any type of contract signings right now as WWE, they have this pending lawsuit coming at them from TNA, as TNA feels that WWE has taken sensitive information that came from one of their former employees and have tried to use it to their advantage to acquire talent such as Ric Flair, possibly Matt Morgan. But, yeah, Matt Morgan was down there at uh, WWE headquarters, so, you know, he quietly is you know, wrapping things up with the TNA organization. So I find it pretty funny that they're moving on now and they're trying to make Brooke test marker. I apologize. I know I shouldn't be calling her Brooke, but, I mean, it's going to take me a while to get used to calling her Miss Testmarker. I'm so used to calling her Brooke Testmarker, but whatever. Anyway, Miss Testmarker, uh, only thing I have to add to that is if you're really going to go all the way with Testmarker being the new direct auto insurance spokesperson, Let's get rid of those lame-ass Matt Morgan commercials. That's all I have to say because those commercials just brutally bad, man. And I can't wait to see how they're going to do Testmarker's commercials for a direct auto. Maybe they're going to kind of give it a little bit of a GoDaddy.com type of spin to it where she begins to unbutton her blouse and it goes, oh, if you want to see more, go to directautoinsurance.com. And like a fool, many people will be drooling and they'll go to the website to think that they're going to see literally bare-naked TNA when all they get to see is her cute little red, white, and blue attire. I know, I know. But, hey, it is what it is. From there, former Knockouts champion Gail Kim, she would come in in a jealous little fit and – Tell both ladies that, you know, the whole knockouts division was built around her and that this is nothing more than cheap imitations. That's how she feels. Every All the knockouts that's in the company, that they are nothing more than cheap imitations of her and that it's about class, not ass. And Brooke Hogan, she laid down the gauntlet. And she told Gail Kim, hey, yeah, you do have a rematch clause, and I'll tell you what, your rematch is going to be next week against Miss Tessmacher for the knockouts title. Good luck. And I really liked how Brooke Hogan came off this week. She is looking 
more fit to this role. I like how she's been coming off so far. Uh, she seems to be getting better and better each week. I'm actually starting to believe that she is a knockout executive. I'm I can actually start to appreciate and and kind of feel how valid her role is as the executive for knockouts. The only thing I have to say to creative is just continue to make sure that you limit the amount of times that you have her cross paths with Hulk Hogan. I like how they've just been doing it right now. Just keep it that way. If the two of them do get together, they share the same camera time, it needs to be for something special, something monumental. Until then, keep doing it the way that you're doing it, TNA. Keep the two of them separated. Works really well. Now, from there, we have our fourth match of the night, which saw Rashad Cameron taking on Mason Andrews as it's another X Division tournament match. You know, I was a little bit sad, but I was very happy as I was watching this match because, you know, as a brother, I'm sitting up and I'm I'm watching this match and I'm saying, damn, why we got to have two brothers going at it, man? That's That's just wrong. But the match was freaking fantastic. I was really into this match. I really enjoyed it. Very high-paced. I was just astonished at the moves that these guys were able to do. I was just so amazed at them that uh, I actually said to myself, wow, you know, these guys, this is my first time seeing them. I'm already hooked on them. I'm definitely going to try to look up more of their matches. That's how I'm impressed I was with them. And for you all that were unfortunate to check out these guys, get it on. I highly recommend you go see whatever you might be able to pull up on them online. Rashad Cameron, Mason Andrews. And Cameron, he would pick up the win. He did a very devastating jumping DDT, something that I usually don't get to see nowadays because, you know, if not done right, it can be a pretty bad move for the person that's receiving it. But post matches where it really got funny because Christy Hemi, the lovely Christy Hemi, I love Christy Hemi, she caught up with Cameron and she said, How does it feel to be going to Destination X? And Cameron would say, Hey, as far as he's concerned, everyone at home, everyone in the arena, they're looking at the next X Division champion. And what they have just seen is the beginning of the Rashad Cameron movement. And he would also point out to Christy that next time, when as far as her announcing where he's from and all that, it's not Philadelphia, PA. No, 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 no. It's Philly 215. Philly all day. Scream it. That was his pitch. He said, all right. All right, I was I was liking that. I like how he kind of threw it down there. The only thing I kind of didn't appreciate was the way his afro was just flying all over the place. He looked like he needed to get a pick and just really go to work on it and then have somebody just cut all those jagged edges off, try to make it be a little bit even. You know, it just really needed some help right there. He should give Consequences Creed a call. If anybody knows how to hook the hair up really good, it's that guy. Now, from there, folks, we go to another backstage segment where we see Hawk Hogan is in his office, and he's talking with the cowboy, James Storm, and the Enigma one, Jeff Hardy, as he just gets off the phone talking with somebody, we're not sure who, but he says to this person that he'll update him more on Sting's progress as soon as he gets more information and how, you know, he basically can't understand why those things had happened with Sting a couple of weeks back. Well, James Storm will capitalize on the end of that conversation and say, yeah, how is Sting? How's he doing? And Hogan would point out how, yeah, Sting, you know, he, he's doing okay, but that, you know, he just can't wrap his brain around why somebody would attack Sting like this and, how he hopes to really get down to the heart of the matter, but now we're talking about business at hand here. As Hulk Hogan points out how Jeff Hardy, as of late, he's been really coming off looking like he's ready to rule the world. 
And he would also point out how James Storm, he had a little bit of a confidence problem weeks prior, but that it looks like slowly but surely he's finding his way back to the dance as each week the questions are starting to become what is James Storm going to do next, what's he going to do next week, and he will point out to them how he feels he has a Bound for Glory main event for next week as it's going to be Jeff Hardy taking on James Storm in the main event as they go one-on-one, so big news right there. Now, of course, it's voting time as it's time to find out the fate of Taylor Hendricks. And let's just cut down right to the chase. When it comes to the judges, Taz, plain and simple, he voted yes. Al Snow, he voted no. Now, this no would be interrupted, folks, because right after Taz voted yes, guess who made an appearance on tonight's live broadcast? It would be the one and only Who wants a mustache ride himself? Mr. Joey Ryan, who was in the front of the uh, uh, crowd on the opposite side of the gate, and he had a sign which read, hashtag Joey Ryan, 87%, can't be wrong. And Tash just got out the ring, and he's yelling at Joey Ryan. We see Al Snow. He comes out. He's yelling at Joey Ryan as well. Security come, and they're trying to get him out of the arena. And, you know, it's really funny because Joey Ryan, he is just playing this very well. Now, for those of you that did not check out the episode of the RCWR show that we did about three weeks ago, I think it was, we had Joey Ryan online, and I pretty much asked him some very key critical questions, questions that were not asked by other wrestling radio shows that had the opportunity to have him be on the show. One of the questions that I basically asked him point blank, I said, look, if TNA president Dixie Carter, Hulk Hogan, if they called you as soon as we're done with the show or they you know, call you in a few days and they say to you, hey, would you be interested in accepting a TNA contract you know, would you take it? Joey Ryan, and I'm not putting words in his mouth. You can go, you can check out the show yourself, check out the archives, what have you. He actually said he most likely would not accept the contract, not unless it was a really great uh, deal because he lives out in California. And, you know, it's not like he's in his 20s anymore because he's in his 30s and that, you know, at this point the money would have to be pretty good because, you know, that would involve him relocating the whole nine yards if maybe he could get a contract type of deal like what the first TNA gut check winner, uh, Alex Silva, I believe his name was, said if he could get a contract like that, you know, live out of plant, whatever like that, as long as the numbers are right, he wouldn't mind it. But, you know, hey, so I don't know, maybe at this point, maybe a contract was made, and sooner or later, Joey Ryan is officially going to be on the roster. We'll have to watch this very closely. Mr. Joey Ryan, who was a little irritated of doing so many shows on a Tuesday night, uh, as we were talking in the uh, screening room right before we came live on the air, I said, how you doing tonight? He said, oh, all these shows I got to do. Why is everybody on a Tuesday? I said, well, man, I said, because that's when a lot of stuff goes down on a Tuesday. I said, but, hey, you had your pick. You could have came on Thursday. <laughs> you know, I said, Thursday's a little bit more quieter. He loves the attention. He he needs to stop complaining. He know he loves the attention, Mr. 87%. So really happy to see our boy, Joey Ryan, make another appearance on TNA. Now, as I said earlier with regards to the voting, after they got Joey Ryan out of the picture, recap, Taz, He said yes. Al Snow, he would say no. The basis for his no is basically, hey, you know, Hendrix, you've been around for a long time. No doubt I've seen you grow as a performer, as an entertainer, as a wrestler, but I I just feel that you're not quite ready yet. So she would be given one last opportunity to kick out because whenever it's a split decision, 
the contestant is given 30 seconds to try to pitch themselves to that last judge that basically has their fate in the palm of their hand. So Bruce Pritchard, he's hearing this plea as Hendrix points out to her, you know, point out to him rather, correction, that, you know, she feels that she should be given the opportunity to shine and that basically at some point in their careers, Bruce Pritchard's career, somebody, you know, had to give them an opportunity to prove themselves and she wants to be given that opportunity to basically be able to come down to the ring, get in the ring and do what she does best and prove that she can shine. So Bruce Pritchard, after hearing her heartfelt words, he would point out to her, hey, you're inexperienced, you're green, you're rough around the edges, I like you, I don't love you, but I like you, not sure if you got what it takes, mean streak wise, but you got the heart, you got the desire, most importantly, you have class, we can work with that, my answer is yes, so Taylor Hendricks, she gets a TNA contract, folks. And we actually were in touch with her earlier this week, for uh, those of you curious, because we definitely wanted to follow up on that. We did hear back from her. She w- said that she would get back with us after finding out the results her, of her fate on tonight's episode of Impact Wrestling, because something about it would be a determining factor whether or not she could do the show or not. So we'll definitely be following up with her over the weekend and uh, pay attention to our Twitter feeds, Facebook feeds. As soon as we find out any information, we'll definitely let you guys know. Now, from there, we see a backstage segment now where Kurt Angle is talking with AJ Styles. And AJ, he's very excited. He's talking about how he's got compassion, how he's got his compassion back. He, he uh, feels that the weight is over his uh is o is over his shoulders now and that you know he got what he wanted and how he can't wait to get Christopher Daniels at Destination X as they're gonna be involved in a last man standing match. And he would also point out how it looks as though Daniels and Kazarian are divided tonight, which should be good for them. And Kurt Angle, yeah, he likes what he's hearing from his tag team partner and he says, and look, you know, let's just go out there and let's do what we do best and let's get the job done. So on that note, folks, you know what time it is as time is drawing near. It is time for our last match of the evening as we have the TNA tag titles on the line as Daniels and Kazarian face off against champions AJ Styles and Kurt Angle. Now, key point in this match, Daniels would grab a cheer, but Kazarian would take it from him. AJ would hit him with the Pele. Kazarian, he gives Daniels the finger, tells him to handle AJ himself. He leaves. Kazarian comes up from behind, though, and hits AJ with a steel cheer grabs the ref who got taken out at some point during this whole contest, gets him back into the ring, makes the count. Folks, we got new TNA Tag Champions, Christopher Daniels and Kazarian. Now, I know some of you all that are Kazarian and Daniels fans, you're probably saying, all right. But see, if you kind of look at this a little bit more, like with my approach, it would be why were the belts taken off of them in the first place if they were going to be getting the titles back less than a month later. So are you trying to tell me that basically Kurt Angle, AJ Styles, they got the belts at Slammiversary just because of who they are and what they've done for the company? This was really an opportunity to really elevate the hell out of Kazarian and Daniels at Slammiversary, I feel, because there could have been so much hype built around that for their characters, as they could have said on one of the biggest stages of them all, how they beat those two guys at the 10th anniversary of Slammiversary, 
I mean, Slammiversary is supposed to be a really big deal. You know, it was right up there with Bound for Glory and all the, you know, the the big three pay-per-views. So I don't know. I think they just, I don't know what they were thinking. I'm trying to understand it from a booking standpoint. I just don't understand why the belts were taken off of them but then put back one. I just want them to make up their mind. If they're going to leave them as the champions, leave them as the champions already. Let's see what they can do with it for a good period of time. But despite all that, tonight's episode of Impact Wrestling was definitely pretty good. It was on point. I definitely liked it from a production aspect as it seems that they just are coming off better and better each week. It seems like whatever little hiccups they might have got the week prior, they are just doing a fantastic job of making the overall value of the show even better. So I like how they executed this week. I'm going to have to go out there and I'm going to have to give them an 8 out of 10 this week. I I thought they did pretty good. Uh, For those of you wondering why 8 out of 10... I mean, it's not one of those episodes where, you know, you're going to remember six months from now. Um, I can't find anything bad about it, but, you know, it wasn't one of those all-time greatest freaking moments of Impact Wrestling. Eight out of ten, that's, you know, that's a damn good number, I think. I think the ratings should definitely be pretty good. Uh, We should definitely see what's going to happen with the ratings. We'll know more about that probably tomorrow night. We'll definitely... Post it on our website as soon as that information becomes available. But that's going to do it for your recap of TNA Impact Wrestling. Definitely like how things have been developing with Austin Aries, Robert Root. That seems to be going in the direction that it's going into right now. Loving that. Uh, Love the fact that our girl, Taylor Hendricks, she's got her contract. Really awesome right there. Um... I want to be happy for Kazarian and Daniels getting the tag belts back. I just want to see how they're really going to be utilized, though, before I get a little too excited. But I love seeing Sanjay Dutt come back. Even though Rubik's didn't look like a Rubik's, I was definitely feeling him. I was feeling just everything. I like the injection of new with a little touch of old. It was overall Production value-wise, you know, it was a really great show. And I know one of our followers, they had the following to say, because we know that Shane Douglas has the extreme rising events that's going to be coming up this weekend. He said, Shane Douglas, take notes from TNA. And, hey, that's a very valid point. We're going to do this because we only have but just a little bit of time left. We're going to take a brief commercial break, and I mean brief. We're going to get into the phone zone here. Uh, we got to keep it brief tonight. I know we got a few people that are on hold, uh, one or two people. Definitely want to hear your thoughts on tonight's impact, but you got to try to keep it brief. I think two minutes tops because we have a little bit of wrestling-related news that we want to cover. So let's go on ahead right now, and let's take that commercial break and then when we come right back we will jump right into it so we're just going to pause for like about oh 60 seconds and then we'll come right back folks hang tight Listening to the Impact Showdown with Lee Sanders. All right, and we're back. You're listening to the Thursday night edition of Impact Showdown on June 28th, 2012. We only got about, oh, nine minutes left, so we're going to go on ahead now. We're going to open up the uh, phone lines. 
Got to keep it brief tonight, folks, because we got just a little bit of wrestling news that we want to try to tackle real briefly here and give you all some uh, programming notes on uh, what we got planned up for the uh, weekend. So without any further ado, I see we got our good friend Dave from the Michigan area at 269. Dave, you're live on the air, my friend. How you been? Hey, I'm good. I just want to... Hey, hey, great job real quick on the Kristen Wall piece. I was watching that Tuesday night. It was a, I enjoyed your perspective of the whole thing. And yeah, I'll get real thank quick you. In, yeah, I'll get real quick into it. Um, I, it does seem like Joey Ryan has some kind of deal worked out with TNA. And um, uh, I think about how that whole AJ Styles and uh, the whole angle went. It's kind of awkward how they're going with it, but what are you going to do with AJ supposed to be in the fire? But um, uh, overall, I came off tonight, I mean, just like thinking like, wow, this is another really good impact. I was really impressed with TNA tonight. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a good show. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was liking that. You know what? You brought up a very valid point because, I mean, that totally like almost flew by me too. I'm glad you said that. Uh, Folks, Post match uh, is where it got really interesting because Daniels would reveal how it turns out AJ Styles is the supposed baby daddy of Claire's kid. And if you notice at the very beginning of the show, uh, we had you know sat up and said that hey, it looks like TNA they pulled something out of my playbook that I said last week because I said the way that they needed to clean the storyline up was to just have Claire sit up and say that she's been getting Dixie Carter and AJ Styles help on top of getting cleaned, but also to find out who her baby daddy was because somebody took advantage of her while she was in her uh, drugged up state of condition or whatever. And a lot of people, they were like, yeah, that's a really great freaking idea. Glad you came up with that. And now here we go a week later and, you know, they, they tried to – because they knew they kind of messed up last week. So I, I can appreciate them trying to clean it up. It's what they should have went with from the very beginning. Uh, what else did you like about Impact this week, Dave? Oh, there's a lot of good matches on there. I was hoping for Bruce Pritchard with the whole thing. I thought he was going to say he loved her for a minute. I was hoping for that line, but I didn't get it. But I thought Joe, Bubba, and I believe – RVD is showing me, like, man, this guy still can really put on a great match. I was questioning yeah. him for a while, but it's like, man, he's really doing a great job. Yeah, it really is, really is, definitely. Well, Dave, you know we appreciate you uh, chiming in your thoughts uh, on the show, man. We definitely appreciate it. And, folks, uh, you know, you, you know, our phone lines is open for a few more minutes. I'm just going to run through some quick little plugs or whatever like that, and then that's going to be it. So if you want to jump in on the conversation, you're more than welcome to. we got about five minutes left. Feel free, jump on then, press that option and make yourself live on the air. Toll free, 1-888-342-9848. I wanted to do the show a little bit longer, but considering that we had did a two-hour-plus show on Tuesday night, I kind of sat up and said, ah, you know, I really – wasn't sure if you guys might have been filling a two-hour edition tonight, so I had sat up and said, nah, let me just, you know. We'll, we might extend it a little bit next week. Only thing wrestling news-related-wise that really jumped out at me that I thought was a bit, mm, is the latest on what's going on with Tara. As, you know, at one point she used to work for the WWE under the name Victoria, And that's where I officially first became hooked on to her and followed her career ever since. And she would let it be known about the latest accusations that Ken Donnie, uh, who was also known as Kenny Dystra in the WWE, as he recently has been making headlines talking about how John Cena is the Tiger Woods of the WWE, how he's basically putting his seed in every single WWE diva, how he's basically been cheating on his wife Liz even after they got married. And one or more wrestlers have started to come forth and support Kenny's claims. 
and it got to the point where one of the claims that Kenny had made was that a former WWE diva was messing around with John Cena as she was dubbed as his diva road girl or road girlfriend and that she was married to somebody that wasn't associated with the business. So you had to fast forward and do your homework back in 2007 and go, well, who the hell is it that's possibly, you know, that Kenny's talking about? And at the time, you know, you have to think about the 2007 draft, and the only thing that had really happened during that whole year, we saw Tory Wilson leave Raw, go to SmackDown. We saw Victoria go from Raw to SmackDown. So... Victoria, she's been married to the same guy since 1998, and he's not associated with the wrestling business. So on a internet uh, uh, radio show, she had sat up and she had, you know, pointed out her point of view, saying how she didn't appreciate Kenny basically sitting up and indicating her without being blunt about it. And she would go on record. She would say, hey, it's you know, there is a little bit of truth to what he's saying, but let me set the record straight. Yes, me and John Cena, we did date, but it wasn't during the time frame that Kenny mentioned. We actually had hooked up a couple of years prior to that. My husband and I, we had hit a rough patch in our marriage, as I'm sure every single other marriage does. I was dating other people for about a month. I dated John Cena for a month. My husband was dating other women. During that time period as well We held nothing back from one another And you know eventually you know, We did reconcile And that was it And you know I always have appreciated Victoria I've appreciated everything That you know she says She really comes off as a true professional And just somebody that's really not about the games Or the BS And uh, I just really like how she had handled herself If you want to read a little bit more About what all she had to say Check out the article We got it up on our website over at InfinityOneProductions.com. Really great piece. And Kenny, of course, like a dumbass, he would apologize. You know, oh, I wasn't trying to indicate it was Tara, blah, blah, blah. You know, that was pretty much it. That's going to pretty much do it, though. Um, You know, not really too much has been going on wrestling news related wise. Um, You know, we pretty much covered everything that we had needed to cover on Tuesday night show. So I definitely recommend you check out that deluxe edition. as That was really our meat and potatoes of the night. So that's really going to do it. Now this weekend, hopefully we'll be sitting down and we'll be conducting an interview with pop Australian singer Vassy. We'll be talking about her music career, her latest album that's out. Hopefully we'll be able to do that. Keep tabs on us on our Twitter page over at Infinity One Prod. What else? You can also keep track of us on Facebook at Infinity One Productions. Other than that, that's going to do it, guys. I thank all of you that are going to be checking out this show on the downloads, uh, Stitcher, iTunes, Zoom Marketplaces. Thank you all that's going to be checking this out on YouTube shortly. I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend and you get to enjoy some weather and you start making plans for the 4th of July holiday. And that's going to do it. We will have a new episode that's going to be airing next Tuesday night, which is going to be, wow, already, July 3rd, folks. So do join us at uh, 11 o'clock p.m. Eastern. That's it. Y'all take care. I'm the Black Avenger, Lee Sanders. And until I hear from you all next time, you all be safe and you all be kind to one another. Have a great weekend, folks. Smash shout out to everybody. Great show tonight. Let's do it again next Tuesday night, 11 p.m. Eastern. For everybody in the chat room, Mass shout out. Everybody take care.